Hi everyone, uh, welcome to Android Developer Lab Plus. This week we're going to be talking about notifications. Um, and uh, this is actually our second run time through because uh, we, we, we seem to have some technical difficulties. So uh, hopefully we get it right this time. And uh, with that being said, let's move on to uh, news before we talk about notifications. So uh, news for this week is that we've launched a new developer console. Um, so if you've ever published an Android app before or if you've even registered as an Android developer, you can go to the, uh, your developer console or your publisher console now and you can uh, enable the new console. Uh, it's something that we, we've been working very hard towards. Uh, we announced its beta uh, in, at, at Google I.O. three months ago in June. Actually, uh, it was a bit over three months ago. It was at the end of June, so uh, three and a half months ago. And um, you know, we're, we're thrilled that we can finally launch it to the world. We've had some very positive feedback. But we want to hear, uh, continue to hear your feedback. So if there's something that you feel is, uh, uh, could be better, we, we definitely want you to, to send us that feedback. Uh, the other thing we want to announce is that we now support a couple new uh, buyer currencies in India and in Russia. So you can actually now, when you publish your apps, you can specify the local price that users will pay in those countries. Um, this is not seller support, so don't, don't get that part mixed up yet. Uh, we're still working hard towards that, but uh, you know, this is a good first stepping stone for, for Indian uh, users and, and Russian users. Uh, so next slide, please. Last week we announced something that we call ADL Plus Experiments. And uh, ADL Plus Experiments is basically a way for uh, Android developers to get involved in some of the, uh, the APIs that we present here on ADL Plus. And uh, so we're hoping that this is the first of many experiments. Uh, and basically what it is is that last week we presented uh, on the connectivity APIs. Um, uh, or Anirudh presented. So we're, we're asking you to build something cool with those connectivity APIs and showcase it to the developer, the Android developer community. Uh, you know, uh, so s submit away. We, what you need to do is add uh, plus ADL plus experiments on Google Plus. Um, there's a, a, a shortened URL there, but you can just do a search for it on, uh, on plus two. Uh, and basically add that page, build your app, uh, your APK, share it with that plus page, uh, and let us know how how we uh, should use your app, what makes it cool. Uh, so we've set up a, a cutoff date of the 30th of October, so it gives you several weeks to build it. And it doesn't have to be totally polished. It's really about the creative concepts that we're looking at. Uh, and uh, you know the, 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 the ones, the apps that we find to be most creative, we'll, we'll try and uh, bring those developers on uh, ADL Plus in a future episode. We'll try and showcase your app. Um, and uh, yeah, we we really want to be just uh, surprised and impressed by the the creativity the creativity of this community. Uh, so with that being said, I'm going to now hand it over to Tony, who's going to talk about notifications. Thank you, Ankur. Uh So today our presentation is about our notifications, and uh, so. Before we dive uh, deeper deeper to uh, the, the details, so so let's uh, do an overview of like what notification is uh, for. Um, so notification is really uh, a feature to allow developer to display messages to uh, to user outside of uh, your application user interface. Um, in, it also keep the user uh, in, informed about some important events. That requires the immediate attention. Um, another use case of uh, notification is uh, you can you can you can use it as a kind of uh, as a lock in in Android uh, that chronicle events while the user is not like uh, using the phone or paying attention. So when to use a display a notification? So the the primary use case is really on like time sensitive events. And also, uh, usually these kind of events also involve other people uh, to the to the phone owner. Um, some other use cases uh, could be using uh, notification for asynchronous or undirected information, but uh, but in in these uh, cases, uh, we 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 said, uh, recommend developer to 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 allow user to opt in or opt out to that uh, that kind of notification. So, 
so when not to uh, display a notification? So there are there are there are actually quite a few like uh, um, scenarios you, you probably don't want to use a notification. Um, one example is uh, if if the user is already in your application and uh, the, you, the the information you you want to present in the notification is already currently on the screen, uh, don't 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 create a notification. Um, so also, uh, low-level technical operations uh, shouldn't be included in the in, in notification as well. And uh, and sometimes, like when you have errors that 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 your application can recover, uh, those those are the stuff that probably not a good candidate for notification. And finally, um, if you if you create uh, if you just think about like. Presenting a notification just merely to advertise your uh, your your application or just create brand awareness. Um, th those are not uh, uh, good candidates for notification again. And uh, in in those cases, you probably want to consider building a widget uh, to to in order to keep your user engaged with your ad application. So. So what's new in Jelly Bean in terms of uh, notification features? Uh, so one one main thing we introduce in Jelly Bean is uh, we we add rich notification support, and uh, and I will talk uh, uh, in detail about that uh, later. Um, so and another important thing developers should be aware of is uh, now uh, in Jelly Bean or later, a uh, user can now disable uh, notification. Uh, per application, so uh, so that that's really actually give developers some incentive to 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 do notification properly because now we really user can completely dis uh, disable your 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 notification. Um, another nice things we add in uh, in notification is in Jelly Bean is we add a priority. Uh, so in the past, developer has to uh, probably choose to use ongoing notification in order to keep the uh, notification sticky on on the screen. Uh, but now we have a, a, a better uh, mechanism to to handle different kind of notification in different priority. So notification, uh, we before we talk about. Which so, uh, notification? Let's say he with, we're really let me just mute. Okay, so I think. Okay, so for uh, before we talk about which notification, let's talk about um, the standard, uh, the basic layout for notification. So this is what uh, we uh, we have uh, prior to uh, Jelly Bean. So it's really um, the. A few like components in in the notification. The content title. There's a large icon on the left, um, con and also you can put some text under the title, um, and also some con uh, content information. In the lower right corner, you can add a small icon, and also the time of your notification. So, go to next. Uh, we'll talk about which notification. So this is. Um, uh, again, introducing Jelly Bean, and uh, and now one thing uh, kind of special is uh, in the past we you need to create a custom remote view to uh, to create like actions, uh, but now actions are really first class citizen in the in the in the notification framework. Uh, it also uh, uh, a lot more flexible in terms of size size and layout. Uh, it can um, grow up to. Uh, 256 dp in height, which is uh, what we call four unit of notifications. So um, in in the past, uh, is 64 dp uh, per per uh, per notification. So you can have four times up to four times the size of uh, 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 notification you can you can use. Um, we we added priority, so uh, five different type of priority, and um, and again. Use those priority uh, um, responsibly. So this is uh, the big view I I, I was mentioning uh, in uh, for which notification. Um, so pretty much like we we, we still have uh, all all the all the old components existing component. 
but we, we added a new uh, uh, com uh, component called detailed areas uh, for, 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 the, for the big view. Yeah, I just uh, I just want to sorry, Tony. I just want to yeah. emphasize there uh, that notifications are, you know, originally they were just being used as a as a way to to showcase instantaneous information, um, like hey, you have an instant message. But you can see with all of this uh, capability that we're adding into rich notifications, it's it's a lot more than just conveying. You know, instant information. You can see here in this screenshot, we can see the the list of Gmail conversations. Uh, Tony talked about the fact that uh, we can have actions on there, and uh, what that really means is that users are able to interact with your app without actually switching into your app. Uh, so it's a really great way to keep them engaged without having them go in and out of apps all the time. Yeah. So you you really want to uh, for some of the simple tasks uh, that. Uh, user can quickly handle uh, within the notifications, uh, and then those are actually what by those uh, the action buttons are are, are for. Um, and for the complex uh, task, it's still recommended to do uh, to redirect your user to to your to your application to do these like uh, ambiguous like complex tasks. And uh, for simple stuff, uh, you can really enhance the user experience. Um, if you if you if you create actions like within the notification, so so let's talk about how to create uh, a simple notification. So one thing uh, we we add later in the in in, in our API is uh, we have we now have a builder uh, to to build notification. So um, and also we we also in, introduce uh, something called notification compat uh, in the support library. Uh, so that that makes uh, your, your notification implementation like uh, backward compatible. Um, so it it, it it doesn't uh, it's not in the sense like uh, all the all the rich notification feature will be available in uh, in in the in the older uh, uh, in device that have older uh, Android o uh, versions, but uh, it, it it helps to make sure your code will not break in uh, in old in O Android OS, um, so there are a couple of uh, required contents in uh, for a notification. So a uh, small icon, um, a title, and and the and the detailed text. So uh, this is a code snippet on uh, how to use Builder uh, to to build a simple uh, notification. Um, so the so so the next uh, next things I want to uh, go through um, is how to create a big view. So the the, the the really the rich notification UI. So it turns out uh, we have a few uh, new style. Uh, we we make it really uh, easy for a developer to to create these like uh, uh, big view. Um, so we have a few templates. So so one of them is called inbox style. So you can. Uh, uh, use the compatibility uh, library class uh, inbox style. Uh, create an instance of that, and then you can add uh, um, the, the content title for for the big view, uh, which is a replacement of the the, the small uh, the regular content title. Um, and then you can add like new lines uh, with the details, and then set uh, the inbox style as a as the style you use for. Or big content view. So there are other styles that I mentioned available. So one is called big, big picture style. So uh, if you are building some uh, social network style like application or or, or, or photo sh uh, or photo uh, application uh, that has a lot of pictures, uh, you can consider using the picture style. Uh, Big text again, of course. Like, is you, if you have more text you want to display, that's probably what you want to use. And if your if your application actually involve like uh, um, uh, multiple like uh, messages or information, so you can use the inbox style. So here is kind of like a, a, a breakdown of like things like how uh, how the uh, each different style um, uh, what is available in each style. So title is really um, um, 
for 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 a notification in in the normal view we use a set content title, and for all the big views uh, we are using set big content title. It's really a replacement of the set content title content. Uh, small icon uh, will is available through throughout the, all all the normal and big view. Uh, one caveat we notice is like uh, in order to have that small icon to show up on the screen, you, you really need to set the summary text. Um, so large icons will be available across uh, all different style again, and uh, and for content text. Um, so normal style, you use set content text, and but for big text, it's actually not available um, because it, uh, for big text we have a special uh, method uh, called big text that you can that allows your, your developer to add uh, the, the big chunk of text in uh, in, in, in the big view. Uh, big picture uh, is also again only available in the big picture style. And finally uh, the summary text is available in all the big views. Uh, so so th this is kind of like a nice summary of like uh, what's available in a uh, different style of uh, yeah I, I totally agree Tony this is um, this is actually a really really uh, useful summary that um, you can spend some time trying to find this sort of information so it's um, it's really useful one other thing that I'll just add with uh, the inbox style is that you can actually add multiple lines of text there's a method called add line um, and it's quite interesting in the way that it works where whereas with big Big text, it'll actually automatically wrap the line and uh, try and put as much of the text in that view as possible. With inbox, what it will do is for each line, if that line is too long, it won't wrap the line, it will ellipsize it. So basically, what that means is it will truncate the text and put a dot, dot, dot at the end of each line. So just a subtle difference there that's also worth uh, noting. Yeah, thanks, Anka. Um, so one thing uh, probably you you want to pay attention is uh, when 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 you when you when when the user actually click on the notification, uh, you you really want to preserve the the, the back step the, the navigation and uh, if, um, so so here's how it works like you you have you, you create an intent you want to create a pending in intent that's 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 actually what you what you do when you when you launch uh, um, uh, something from from notification uh, but uh, but there's one additional step you need to do is to uh, create a ta uh, a task deck builder to 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 add the, the previous like uh, activity uh, before um, in this, in the in the back stack, so that uh, when the user hit the back button, it won't uh, just go back to the to the home screen, but instead go into the to to, to your application uh, um, uh, just normally what um, the user would would experience when 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 he is he or she is using your application. So that that one thing is uh, you, you need to pay attention. Um, this. Want to talk a little bit about uh, like removing notifications? So there are a couple ways you can do uh, uh, removing notifications. So of course, like uh, you, uh, the user can do this manually. Uh, but if you if you set your when you build your notification, if you set auto cancel, uh, so this will automatically dismiss your notification when the user actually touched the notification. Uh, of course, again, the user can swipe left or right. Uh, to to clear notification or or they simply click, uh, hit the clear all button. Uh, also, programmatically in your in in your in your application, you can use uh, two methods: uh, uh, a cancel method uh, provided by a, uh, with with a parameter of the the notification ID, or you can cancel all the notification you create. So this is uh, particularly useful. Uh, uh, when 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 you want to handle your notification intelligently, we we talk about that like in in in, in some of our talks before um, to create intelligent notifications. Like one example is um, if 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 there are any if there are some events uh, that that is already in the past, like calendar, um, like uh, could be a, a calendar application. You you may want to actually remove some of the. Uh, 
irrelevant uh, notification because it's already passed uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the event. So, uh, so these methods will be useful for taking care of uh, not, um, uh, expired notification. So just to summarize again, um, so one thing is uh, use notification judiciously. Uh, primarily, you want to only use notification for time-sensitive time uh, uh, information or, or things that involve like people. And uh, keep in mind to make notification optional, because as now in Jelly Bean or later, a user can completely disable it. So your app should not have really features that only are available through uh, actions in the, in the notifications. So that's very important. And finally, uh, use notification compat uh, in the support library um, to, to take care of backward compatibility. So yeah, I just want just to add to the, uh, the comment that Tony said about using them judiciously. Um, an example of where you would call it a bad use of notifications is if you have an app that uh, preloads or refreshes every so often, it's not a good idea to use a notification to say, hey, I'm doing this in the background. I'm uh, you know, fetching your, your, new, your next set of emails or your news feed. That sort of information is fairly superfluous. Um, it's the kind of information that you could choose if you wanted to show it within your app. But the notification is certainly not the place where, where you would do that. There are exceptions where, some, where it's something like a download. Because a download is something that a user has explicitly initiated. So in a web browser, for example, um, there it kind of makes a little bit more sense because they might be waiting for that file to come through. But certainly you shouldn't be doing it just for periodic updates or anything like that. It's the, those two points about being time sensitive and, and involving sort of either the user or, or uh, people that the user is familiar with, it's, uh, it, it's quite an important uh, point. Right. So, so two things that can help you to, if you if you are really worried about the, the user experience, so the two things you can, that can help you to, to do is uh, to 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 address that is like uh, one, uh, have a settings in your application to make notification or part some of the notifications like opt in or optional, uh, so the user has a choice to do it. Uh, the other thing is if you think some of the notification maybe to uh, low level or not not ex directly relevant. Consider using a, a low priority uh, notification. Let the, let the system, let the framework handle handle those things properly for you. Yeah, actually, uh, one of the, the the games we recently featured, uh, I think it was last week uh, or maybe the week before, called Kingdoms of Camelot. Um, I was trying this game out, and it's. It's sort of like a Farmville type clone set up uh, in a fantasy world. So you're, you're building farms and you're, you're training armies and researching better swords and so on. They had an interesting use of notifications where because the game is very much based on real time, so it'll say something like, uh, you can only build one building at once and it's going to take two hours to build it. They use a notification to let the user know that, hey, the building is done. So it kind of reminds you to get back in the game. It's a little bit more engaging. Now, that was kind of a nice way to do it for that game. And it's, you know, in those situations, you definitely want to have that setting, like Tony said, to have an option to turn that sort of stuff off. Mm -hmm. um, but that was a clever way of doing it because it was getting the user engaged more with that title. You don't want to do it in just a, you know, a periodic daily, hey, have you come and launched my app recently or anything like that. Uh, but, you know, think about really, we always at Google, we always talk about putting the user first. So think about what is it that will add value to the user from your app. Yeah. So I think for for the application, another thing that may also complement what they're doing is they, they can probably create a widget as well. So that that may be also a, a good option so you can user engage with the games. All right, so that's pretty much what I have this week uh, for the presentation. And let's move on to Q&A. Uh, I think, Ankur, do, do you have uh, the moderator? Um, well, actually, the first uh, moderator question was, was by Andrew, Andrew Kelly, who's 
uh, live with us today. So, um, Andrew, do you want to uh, just ask live? Uh, yeah, sure, no worries. Um, it was related to um, in-app billing. Um, I've got an app that has in-app purchases uh, for managed items, and I was just trying to work out if they sort of uninstall the device, uh, the the app from the device, and then reinstall it. I can call a method to get back their purchases uh, from the Google Play store to see if you know what items they've actually purchased. But there doesn't seem to be a way of getting the details of the individual items that they've you know paid for and stuff. So I was just trying to work out how I would do that without having to store each one in a database on my server. Yeah, that so typically sense. the I mean you when you do restore transactions you are getting um uh the transactions back, right? Like the purchases, you you're getting that information, aren't you? Uh well, I don't think so. I mean the the, the callback method that gets called just seems to return a response object that says yes or no. I was trying to work so, out which part of the API actually provides so, the list of. So what it's supposed to tell you is, hey, does that purchase been purchased or not? Right? Is that is that correct? Uh, I guess I'm what what information are you trying to glean out of it in your in your app? Because the way the way managed item the the way restore transactions for managed items works is that it basically tells you, hey, these are the list of items that have been purchased. And uh, just for the audience, managed items are typically one-off purchases. They're not the consumable type of purchases. So once you know that you've purchased a, a particular uh, item, you know that it's un it should be unlocked in, in your app or uh, available in your app throughout. So it, do it won't give you necessarily all the, the same level of detail that you get when you purchase the, uh, the item for the first time, but it should at least tell you the API should be telling you, hey, that this particular item ID has been purchased. And pretty much on a restore um, workflow, that, that should be enough to get you through. You, we, we, if you want to store the extra information that we do on the initial purchase, um, you, you do need to store it on a server. But yeah, no, I, I guess I'm trying to understand, is there, a, is, is there something critical that's missing on that restore transaction that, that uh, you're not getting? Yeah, well, I'm just trying to work out which bit has that list of information because if, if I call the restore transaction, the callback method is called on restore transactions response, and the only two parameters that get passed back there is the request and a response code, and the response code only seems to say OK or not OK. It doesn't seem to have a list of the actual items as part of that response. Oh, I see. Um... Good question. Uh, I'm just uh, looking that up, but if Tony or Anirudh, uh, whilst uh, I'm looking it up, if you guys know off the top of your head, uh, it's I'm a good... using the flag at the moment, the sort of the yes or no flag that comes back to kind of hide my adverts, because as soon as you make an in-app purchase, I kind of remove my advertising, but the managed items in the game form a progression, so you can only buy sort of level 10 after you've bought level 1, so my shop changes based on which items you've purchased previously, so I kind of need to know those items so I can change my UI. Yeah. I just couldn't um, seem to find a way. Maybe there's a, 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 a callback and I've got, you know, missing or something. That uh, let me, I, I, I don't know it off the top of my head, but what I'll do is uh, let me follow up with you uh, after this. Uh, I'll yeah. look it up and I'll, and I'll get back in touch with you. No um, worries. And uh, we, can, we can take it from there. And we'll, we'll share the uh, the answer on, on next week's ADL Plus as well. Yeah. It's one of those things that uh, it's it's hard to know all of this stuff off the top of your head, and it's yes, yes. Uh, this this is one that we don't uh, know off the top of our heads. Uh, okay, next question. Um, it's from Andy C in Perth, Australia. Are there any code examples of using Media Codec to encode audio, i.e., PCM to AAC? I'm having a hard time finding any information about this class. Uh, Anirudh or Tony, do you guys want to chime in here? Uh, right. I, I just collected a sample from CPS, uh, Compatibility Test Suite, which has a decoder test in it, and so I've pasted it on just let me pull the link up. Uh,
So I'm going to paste this on the Hangout chat so that you'll be able to see this. All right, so I've pulled up the uh, decoder test, and below that uh, decoder test class, which explains media codec and how do you initialize it and how do you create the output buffers to decode. And below that, I have pasted some snippets of code, and they kind of follow a similar pattern. And these, this is the encoder. Uh, uh, these are the encoder API calls. So you can probably look at this and see if you can gather something. Let us know how that works for you. All right, cool. Hey, uh, Andrew, I just wanted to follow up on uh, on that uh, on your question, uh, yeah. and if if this isn't sufficient, we will take it we'll take it offline. Uh, but basically, what should be happening is that you should be when you do a restore transactions, at some point you should be getting an intent uh, saying purchase state changed, uh, okay. and that should be the same intent that you received when you first made the purchase. No worries, I've got, I've got that method overridden. So yeah, maybe I just need to do a bit more testing. Yeah, yeah. So that that part of the workflow should be the same whether it's the initial purchase or the restore. Um, if if uh, you do have any uh, issues with that, reach out to me and I'll uh, I'll be happy to to help out. Yeah, no worries. Brilliant. Thank you. No problems. Uh, just a couple of questions from last week's ADL Plus. There was a question about uh, a developer having some map activity issues. Um, uh, that we we had some discussions offline and we we resolved it. Basically. Uh, if you saw the the uh, question last week, it was basically along the lines of, "Hey, my map activity. Uh, I've got an app with that uses map activities, and uh, on certain devices, I'm noticing that it it crashes on startup. It turns out that those devices that he that they were running on were uh, not your standard Android devices that ship with the Google services, uh, and so uh, basically the app was crashing because the Google Maps didn't exist on that device." The only type of the only situation where you can get those kind of devices are devices that are are not your uh, Google uh, Google Play certified devices. So anything that ships with Google Play, uh, which is where you know this developer was distributing their app, uh, should have Google Maps on it. Uh, there is actually some uh, I pointed that developer also towards some code that they could add in their app, uh, where at startup they could check statically check whether the the map activity class is available, and if it's not, then degrade the experience so that their app doesn't crash, but it doesn't provide the the map capability that that might be there. Um, so uh, we we were able to resolve that. The uh, the other question that we had last week that was unresolved had to was also to do with um, uh, referrals. So if you've got an installation referral and you pass in referral IDs about that not being uh, passed around so that they weren't able to track when apps were coming, were installed as a result of other apps referring them. Um, basically, the, the resolution there was that they needed to use a URL as opposed to an intent. Uh, the information that's passed in an intent is, uh, is not necessarily used, and what they should be doing is passing in a play URL with the extra parameters at the end, uh, and then the uh, referral ID will should get passed through correctly. Uh, so that's all the questions that are up this week. Um, is there anything else, Anirudh or Tony, you guys wanted to add? No? All right. Well, thanks, everyone, for, for tuning in. We will see you again next week uh, at the same time. Till then, see you later. Cheers, guys. Oh, and uh, don't forget to uh, uh, continue looking at the ADO Plus experiments. Uh, we're, we're keeping an eye out for those submissions. All right. Thank you. See you later. Bye, Andrew. See you.